Today is November 30th, 2022. Welcome to Native Calgarian. Oki Naganago Mekoche Chesikom Oki or Dakotes Nagotine Siku. Hi, my name is Red Thunder Woman. My married English name is Michelle Robinson, and I use she and her pronouns. My Dene lineage roots me in the land of the Great Bear Lake tribe in Treaty 11. My name, Dakotes Nagotine. Uh, my people were rabbit skins, so we've been referred to as the land of the hair people. Uh, I'm a native to Turtle Island, and my Dene nation is a visitor to this area of Klincho Tine Indahe in Satu Dene, meaning many big dog town, named after the Calgary Stampede. I was born in Calgary or in Blackfoot, Mokinstis, as Michelle Elliott, an English name which has afforded me privilege in an English colonial world. My mother is Northern Slavey Dene or Satu Dene, but my Indian Act imposed status card by the Canadian government says Yellow Knives Dene. Through my father, I am a daughter of the Mayflower, a daughter of the American Revolution, and I have an Indian Act and Post status card, which is a colonial construct by Canadian policies meant to divide Indigenous peoples' inherent rights. Indigenous Two-Spirit, or the Indigenous Two LGBTQ plus community, and Indigenous women were at the bottom of the Canadian socioeconomic ladder because of colonial trauma, imposed poverty, racism, gendered violence, and land theft. I do not speak on behalf of all Indigenous, but I share my journey as I walk the red road. As a woman who has attempted to uh, run after joining harmful colonial parties, spent money to be at expensive conventions, left my home to travel to conventions just to vote on incomplete policies that still allow for incarceration and a denial of justice and denial of healthcare services, racism, um, colonial trauma, genocide of Indigenous and Black peoples, I have worked to continue reports to advocate for and attempt to work within these systems meant to harm me and my community. I think of all of this today and I hope we honor the many lives of Indigenous people that are being lost in this so-called country named Canada. I hope that you all see your role in the importance of stopping harm and as a citizen see your role in reconciliation and as a treaty partner. Pride Month should not just be one month, as it's important to understand the straight agenda and gendered violence was and is forced on these lands by Christian outsiders. Land acknowledgements are critical for creating a safer space for all Indigenous, as well as honoring the host as a guest and acknowledging your role as a treaty partner in a so-called time of reconciliation. It's important that your land acknowledgements have meaning. Uh, stories of displacement, how you perceive your role as a treaty partner, a citizen of Canada, a refugee, or other land displacement, so we as Indigenous peoples know how safe you are to be around. If you don't know how to pronounce your local Indigenous nations' names, won't say your pronouns, won't say your story of origin, won't acknowledge stolen lands, it imposed economic oppression, your role in reconciliation, I determine how safe you are to be around my community, my family, and myself. Understanding land acknowledgements and their importance is Indigenous 101 because it immediately addresses colonialism, oppression dynamics, broken treaties, and lies taught today in Canadian schools nationally. That's why settlers and those who call themselves Native Calgarian or whatever town you might be from, you show me you have no Indigenous 101 understanding. Uh, Jesse Wente's book on Reconciled explains it perfectly, as do so many other Indigenous authored books. Land Back is a movement that could save the planet from climate change created by colonialism. But uh, people would have to understand the treaty partnership, be part of meaningful reconciliation and honoring global initiatives like the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I honor the Blackfoot as the elders and members have been so kind to me on my Red Road journey. Elder Red Crane taught me how to pronounce my spirit name in Blackfoot, and Leonard Kenny taught me how to pronounce my spirit name in Satu Dene. My humblest apologies to the Blackfoot and Elder, or sorry, the Blackfoot and Dene elders and language keepers as I try to learn proper pronunciation. I'm speaking to you on the lands of the Nitsitapi, which is the Blackfoot Confederacy. The Blackfoot south of the imposed U.S.-Canadian border are the Blackfeet, and north of the border are the Siksika, Ganai, and Bagani of the Confederacy. These lands are Treaty 7, signs 1877, with signatures that include the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Wesley, Chiniki, and Bearspaw Nations of the Stony, and the Dene from Sutina. I acknowledge all First Nation, Métis, Inuit, status and non-status across Turtle Island as the keepers of these lands. All non-Indigenous are treaty partners with the government signing on your behalf. My Patreon account is Native Calgarian, where you can pledge and support 
thank you to all my previous donors for showing your support. I can't tell you, uh, it's been a year since uh, we had our mishap and your support had meant the world to us over this, over that time and, and since and before. So just know, I appreciate you from the bottom of my heart and I hope you enjoy listening. Anyway, if you value listening or watching and can afford to give, thank you. To those who cannot afford to give, I'd love to hear from you at nativeyyc at gmail.com where you can send in your comments or questions. Also, giving a review helps whatever medium you're listening from. I have a YouTube channel that you can go and subscribe. Go to nativecalgarian.com for the latest podcasts and pin posts on social media. Well, today we are so lucky we have our 41st guest of this year. That's not including all the other years. Um, Elijah, would you like to introduce yourself in your way? And say hello, everyone. Um, my name is Elijah Ermine Neal. My Cree name is Pisamuyapi Miskanonapio, translates to Rainbow Turtle Man. I use he, they pronouns, and I'm a two spirit, trans, indigenous, queer, polyamorous person in living in Mokinsis, Treaty 7 territory, or Calgary, Alberta. I When I think about how to introduce myself and uh, words to describe myself, those are some words that I use to describe myself. They don't tell you everything about me, but they might give you a picture of where I stand in the world. I'm from Sturgeon Lake First Nation in Saskatchewan, Treaty 6. That's where my father was from. He's He was Cree. My mother is Métis um Scottish and French from southern Alberta Lethbridge area um, and I've recently learned that my Métis family does trace back to Red River settlement and I'm learning trying to find those connections but I spent the last few years focusing on reconnecting to my Cree family in Sturgeon Lake um, as my father was a survivor of the 60s scoop and found our family in his 20s and I was able to meet them um, as well in my 20s. So lots of finding the people that look like me and like my jokes, so that's nice. <laughs> um, professionally, I have a master's of clinical social work from the University of Calgary. Um, I typically worked with two-spirit and indigenous queer young people in my social work career. Uh, now that I've finished my master's and am taking this new part of my path uh, forward, I'm now going to start offering counseling and services yeah, counseling services to two spirit and indigenous queer young people in Treaty Seven and hopefully other places beyond Treaty Seven as people need. I know that in our communities, it's one thing to find an indigenous therapist, it's another thing to find a two spirit or trans or queer indigenous <laughs> therapist. So I'm ready to start working with my community in that way. I also do consulting and teaching, knowledge sharing with institutions, non for profits, organizations, uh, just offering and sharing with the community the things that I've been taught and given, and using my gifts as a two spirit person to participate in the healing and of our people and the resistance of colonization. So I do that. Uh, in my community, I spend a lot of time being a part of ceremony. I attend a sweat lodge in Mokinsis, Treaty 7, that is Cree teachings, and I'm in Escapios there, which is a Cree for elders helper. I am learning how to show up to ceremony in a good way and participate in a good way 
and have a role in my community that is more cultural and traditional. I'm very grateful for that community that I get to be a part of every week. And the two elders that are, that uh, facilitate the lodge and are part of that community actually have uh, adopted me at the beginning of 2021, 2022. Um, and so the elders at that lodge are my adopted parents in this community. And so, yeah, I feel like I, I, I am learning how to have a parallel path existence of having the Western education, the Western experiences, the, the privileges that I have while also having the culture and the the oral traditions and how to exist with that both worlds and walk with them in a good way as a two-spirit person so that's yeah. a little bit about who I am well we're pretty lucky to have you not just on the show but just in general because um, I can personally say that you are a big part of our personal life and uh, you know our little one deserves folks like you in her life uh, their life I know uh our teaching for our um, clan, our group, our tribe is that uh, prior to colonialism, there wasn't really the he or she, it was always they, them. And that's really helped me decolonize the way I use pronouns. And, um, and obviously, I want to honor how people choose to use their pronouns. So, um, you know, having folks like you in my life, having an understanding where Sam is, my, my daughter is coming from, Samantha, um, you know, this is what we need. So, you know, and, and with what you're doing, obviously, I don't want to hog you. <laughs> <laughs> we want to share you and, and grow your business. So do you want to tell us a little bit about what you've named your uh, business and, and how folks can get in touch with you uh, if they're listening here in Alberta and what expansion outside of Alberta might look like? Yeah, for sure. Um, it, it's, it, it was just yesterday, actually, that I finally decided that it was time to get out of my own way and share with you the, rest, the general community, the internet, the people that have been cheering me on for the last year and longer to get to this point of being ready to officially open my business and um, practice, expand my practice. And yeah, so I feel a little bit, uh, it feels surreal, it feels, but also exciting and I'm excited to look ahead. Uh, so I, I am coming, coming forward to my community and I'm offering Peace and Yaffe Wellness Services, which is on the internet as rainbowwellnessservices.com. Uh, Peace and Yaffe is rainbow in Cree. I was gifted my name, Rainbow Turtle Man, in lodge and ceremony. And then in this past year, I did the same thing, gifted this name for my business in ceremony and in lodge. So it is uh, the process of coming forward as Peace Me Happy Wellness Services and developing what that looks like and what it will be has been a process rooted in ceremony from the beginning um, with offerings and tobacco and prayer and lodge. And just, I want to do this in a good way, in a sustainable way. And uh, my friend recently, we were talking actually about this and she gave me the analogy of a forest. And when a, a, there's a sick tree the other trees come and they help, they like give to the sick tree. And in our communities, it often feels like we're surrounded by sick trees and then we find one healthy tree and we put it in the middle of all these sick trees and say, okay, now you're responsible for all these sick trees. And it's, that's, not, that's not real life, like it's not sustainable. And so when I look at myself and the work I've done professionally, personally, 
my own healing journey, discovering who I am as a person and how to be authentic in that. When I look at all those things uh, and find myself in a place where I'm ready to help others do that, I want to make sure that I do not take myself alone into a group of sick trees. Yeah, so I'm very grateful for the community and ceremony and culture to be able to do this in a good way and be sustainable. And so, yeah, Peace Me Happy Wellness Services is my, my business, my practice, my, um, how I'm, what I'm offering the, the community right now, which includes counseling and consulting and teaching and knowledge sharing. Those are my three main pillars right now. I, when people ask me, what's your modality? And like, what kind of therapy do you do? I often get tongue tied and I, not because I don't know, but because I feel like there isn't language for the things that I wanna do yet. And I look around my community and see there isn't really any other indigenous trans therapists in my area. They, like, there might be indigenous therapists or queer therapists or maybe even indigo-queer, but like that indigenous trans counselor, I have not found them yet. I know one of my dear friends is on their way to finishing their uh, master's of clinical social work. So I keep telling them to TikTok, like, come on, graduate. I need you out here. So I, I am very grateful for the community that I do have so that I can be here. And I keep referring to them because this isn't me on my own. This isn't like, oh, Elijah's showing up, like ready to be a therapist. It's like, no, I'm here to embrace what I have to offer to add to the community. To my role is evolved and shifted as I've learned and worked and healed and grown. And I'm ready to embrace that and step into that new role that I'm being gifted. Really, it is a gift. It's an opportunity. It's, um, it's a responsibility. It, being two spirit and Indigo queer is not something that's just like a, I wave a rainbow flag and I'm excited that I'm gay or something. Like maybe for some people, that's what it is. For me, it's a very sacred, sacred medicine, important role for the people that I interact with. It's more than just who I like or what kind of clothes I like to wear or something. It's so much deeper than that. So. Uh, I, yeah, when I think about what kind of therapy am I offering, it's to find the, the Western or the English words to describe that. I think about land-based, using oral tradition, ceremony, being trauma-informed, storytelling, ethical storytelling. As a society, we love telling stories. We have news, we have social media, we have all these things, but when, when do we come forward and really think about the ethical storytelling? And that's when I think about like traditional storytelling and like our cultural ways of storytelling. There's protocol, there's rights, there's processes to receiving, to giving, to making meaning in story. And so that's very important to my work is centering that ethical storytelling. Um, but yeah, there's, it's, it's exciting and it's new, but it's also not unknown, totally unknown. It's not completely new. It's, It's a gift that I've been working with and learning about for a long time now. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to be able to share it. Mm. I think, um, I think there's always a responsibility 
as uh, Indigenous folks, like we, uh, once we have knowledge to share it with those who are Indigenous and protect it from those who are exploiters. Um, so that, I, that came really strong, I think, through how you explained um, why it is, it's so hard to get, um, you know, Western words to understand Indigenous ways when, to me, it's a constant education to non-Indigenous about who we are, what we think, where we're coming from. So, of course, it's almost impossible to say in words what it is that we're doing and what we're contributing when folks are so on the other spectrum of understanding us and have so much anti-Indigenous bias and, and you know, misconceptions that would have to be debunked before we could even move forward about what it is we do. And then with our youth, respecting the, the responsibility that we have to be gentle, trauma-informed, you mentioned that as well. It's so important. And yet, um, you know, and, and the idea of ceremony. And you know, when I talk about uh, treaty, I talk about how it was uh, a sacred responsibility from the folks who made that treaty, how they, you know, lit their pipes, they shared their smudge, they did the ceremony with newcomers, with the belief of the responsibility of what this decision would have for future generations, and going in with good intent. And this is not a conversation in the educational system in any capacity. So I understand why being tongue tied, explaining it to Westerners, how difficult that is, but then for Indigenous people, understanding the responsibility that we have to ourselves, to our ancestors and to the next generations. It's just such a different worldview, as opposed to like today, uh, Jason Kenney resigned. And I, I was like, here's a man who's made decisions on behalf of the country federally, on behalf of the province provincially. And I've never heard him or any uh, Westminster elected politician understand the gravity of the decisions that they make and how they do impact the next generations negatively at times. And they do they understand the responsibility. And uh, down south, there was a, a woman uh, who was a, an elected official, and she had voted for uh, pro-life policies and when she miscarried and was denied the very reproductive services that she was denying all women, she thought, she said publicly, well, I, I just didn't think it would affect um, people like this. And I, I think that's the problem with the Western way and the Westminster um, system is that they don't understand that their decisions not just affect people today, but affect people in the next generations. And that's where you're coming from when you speak about what is it that you do? Well, first of all, not create harm today and hopefully in the future. That's the first step. And that's not even a part of Western culture. Yes, exactly. And just that idea of working, like not creating harm and then taking that one step for, further and being like, but when I do, because I'm human, do I own it? Do I take ownership of that? Do I take accountability? Do I work to amend that? And I think our society, we so often skip over that part or an amend means, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. And that's not, that's not what I've been taught, that I'm a human being I'm gonna mess up sometimes I'm gonna get it wrong uh, whether I'm showing up as my like to my friends to my family to work to my clients I I'm human and I'm gonna get it wrong sometimes and to be able to own that with grace and humility and accountability um, I think is that step in not furthering the harm right like yeah so I agree, I agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well I am um, I'm really grateful that you're you're coming onto the show and you're being vulnerable and you're telling the folks what you're doing and professionally giving that information so that folks can uh, you know 
know how to get a hold of you, start reaching out to you. Um, we had a little conversation earlier about uh, being approved federally through Indian Affairs. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so as far as counseling goes and the who you register with and what's your role and who what insurance covers you and all those things, uh, there's lots of there's lots of rules and terms and things that I've had to learn. I have a master's of social work in, with a clinical specialization in Alberta. So I'm registered as a social worker to the Alberta College of Social Workers. That allows me to practice in the province of Alberta as a social worker. I'm currently in the process of applying to do my registered clinical social work designation, which is similar to a provisional psychologist. You do the set number of hours of supervision, set number of hours of client, con like face-to-face -face interactions, write the exam, pass, okay, you're a registered clinical social worker. Um, so I'm in that process of doing that and have a supervisor, those kinds of things. Once I have my RCSW, so the clinical social work designation, then because I live in Alberta, I need that to be approved by Indian Affairs um, for non-insured health benefits, mental health counseling. So basically, long story short, right now I'm registered to practice in Alberta. That doesn't mean it will, that's gonna stay that way as I continue growing and evolving there. My hope is that I can work with people outside of Alberta counseling wise. I can work outside of Alberta in other ways, just not specifically counseling. Um, and then as far as being covered by non-insured health benefits on, with the Indian Affairs, uh, I am not a provider covered by that at this time and am in the process of like I said, doing my clinical designation so that I can be approved to do that. So lots of hoops to jump through and systems to knock on their doors and fill out their forms. So that's right. I, that's what I mean about the Western <laughs> and the Indigenous worlds. Yeah. So much colonial paperwork. Holy, it's yes. just so wild. So folks who are outside of Alberta, which is at, um, at least over half of my uh, listeners, don't worry if you're in Canada, you're going to be able to access this very shortly. But um, obviously, I, I'm a big proponent for um, self care, uh, mental health, understanding racial battle fatigue. These are, are real issues that we all face. So it's really important that we all have ongoing counseling. I'm um, being a bit of a hypocrite. I've put it off for a year. I've been meaning to do it. I even made a phone call and they returned it twice and I have been yet to uh, call them back yet. So I, I need to also get that set up. So I'm gonna say that with a little bit of transparency. Um, but I think ongoing counseling is important for all of us because um, it's like maintenance of a vehicle. You know, you do the oil changes, you try to keep it up to date, but if you don't, it will break down at the most inopportune time, just like our mental health. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mental health. I feel like any any health is never timed in the way that I would time it, but that's part of the process, part of the journey. That's right. Um, do you have any other um, things that maybe you want to tell, let's say Indigenous youth that might be listening that are wondering, um, how do I even get started in counseling? Yeah. I, well, I when I think about counseling and I talk to people who think about counseling who've never done it before, or they hear the word therapy or whatever, lots of people get kind of squirrely and like, oh yeah, that's a nice idea. But like, even you said, like, oh, I've been putting it off or I'll get there. Um, and then I know some people that hear the word therapy and they're like, yeah, right. Like, I don't need to tell my problems to a stranger. Um, and yeah, I appreciate that. I don't, I'm not here for people to give me their stories and tell me their problems as a stranger like that's not that's not what I want to foster when I 
show up saying that I'm here to work with young people, particularly Indigenous, Indigenous queer two spirit youth and young people, which is a there's not really a set age of what that means. Federally, we have youth goes all the way up to 29, but then provincially we have it goes up to 24. And then you get other places, it's up to 18. So when I say young people, I've worked with people from 12 years old all the way up to beyond 29. So um, I'm happy to work with people that want to find, connect, work through, process things about their, like if they're like gender exploration or what does it mean to be indigenous queer? What does two-spirit mean? Maybe I'm trans, maybe I'm not. Like those kinds of things are primarily the people that I work with and focus on and when I say that, that doesn't mean if you don't have those problems or you figured that part out, like you can't come talk to me. Uh, Cause I know that everything is connected and we're all circular relational beings. And so sometimes I think, yeah, I know who I am and I've solved my gender. And then all of a sudden I realize that it's connected to a problem about X, Y, and Z. So uh, there's no limit, but those that's the population that I will primarily be working with. And um, I'm not here to just be a stranger and demand your story. No, I'm here to build relationships and offer a place to learn how to have healthy healing relationships. I know that sometimes people think that like counseling is the place where you fix it all. That I have learned personally and professionally that the time we spend together is where you learn about the idea in real life is where you practice it and actually integrate it into your life, right? So mm. uh, love that. Yeah. What a, what a great way to encapsulate it. And I, you know, when I, um, I've, I started volunteering at the distress center years ago, and um, we actually talked about you know, when I was raised, I was raised like, you know, grieving is a process like that's really linear. There's a start and there's an end. And uh, then at the distress center, we started talking about how it's a process that you're always going through it. And when a new life milestone happens, you kind of reprocess things. So to me, um, you know, and it is as healthy going to uh, for mental health therapy in some capacity throughout your entire life to help you process as you go so that that way you're not, I don't know, doing something really destructive at any point in your time in, in your life, because, you know, these are really important things for us to learn how not to behave and to, um, you know, try to be the best we can be honoring ourselves, honoring, um, you know, our family, our community, you know, it, it's not easy work. And I actually think it's really courageous when people do the work because um, it's a commitment and it's an understanding. It's a humbling of who we are as people and that we need each other. We need community in order to process life and live life together. Right. So I, I'm really grateful you came here. Elijah, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Thank you for having me and chatting with me. Uh, my final piece, I guess, that I would like to share and speak to is, um, Peace and Miyapi Wellness Services is looking for physical space in Mokinsis G7. And uh, there's details on my website, rainbowwellnessservices.com. There will be further details added to that of what that looks like and what that means, what we're looking for. But I am looking for space to provide individual and group options for counseling and collaborations and consulting. There is a hope and need for a space that doesn't just, that isn't just an office or isn't just outside, like to mix those two. And so I'm asking the community to reach out to me and if they have space that they can offer that they 
know of people that have space that can be offered and shared as well as um, there will be more details coming about donations and funding and the grants that I am working for, like working towards. So yeah, if you know of space, you have space to offer, you have connections to space, that kind of stuff, please reach out to me, rainbowwellnessservices.com and the info is there and we'll continue to be updated. That sounds great. Thanks so much, Elijah. Um, I, I'm going to give a bunch of resources and at any point in time, don't hesitate to kind of jump in and and give more because you are obviously the expert. And, you know, what I try to do, like I know uh, some of these topics can be really triggering for some folks. So I try to give the resources that are needed in the hopes that people will see, uh, you know, they never feel disempowered, that they always feel empowered uh, because there's always solutions. It's just a matter of implementing them. Uh, so for folks who follow me and listen to me, um, you know that I have a monthly Indigenous book club. It's every second Monday of the month. Um, Standoff by Bruce McIver is next on December 12th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Mountain Time, and he has agreed that he would join us. Uh, January will continue our work with the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, and Two-Spirit National Report Inquiry with chapters 9 and 10. And yeah, just look out for, for more books. If you're interested, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, if you're in the local Mokinstis, Calgary area, and you're interested in doing actual reconciliation work we have the reconciliation action group uh, we're all over social media you're more than welcome to join our group and we could use your help as allies we have uh, over a million people and there are very few folks actually trying to work towards certain things um, recently came to my attention that uh, Diefenbaker High School has a, a, a chief's mascot so they call themselves the Deef Chiefs and they have a uh, you know, headdress, etc. And the, the teachers and such tried to say that they had done some outreach to uh, some of the nations. So I have started to do the process of doing outreach to those nations and saying, are you aware this is how they're using our image as a mascot with angry faces, etc. So um, yeah, these are things that have to be done. And so if you believe in it, please donate to us, but also just join our group. And if you don't feel like you're ready yet, uh, learn about Indigenous people through our book club. There's also a Settlers Book Club. And, um, you know, if there are book clubs out there in the world, I, I'd love to promote them in any capacity. Um, Acts of Reconciliation, love to promote them in any way. Uh, we just did a whole bunch of outreach here in Forest Lawn uh, to the community with Fort Calgary, thanks to the Calgary Foundation. These are things that matter to us. Anyway, I'm really proud that this podcast has given solutions and cultural safety training in all of them to create a safer space for Indigenous people, people of colour, those with disabilities, and 2SLGBTQ plus to speak. Thank you, authors Cheryl Ward, Chelsea Branch, Alicia Fridkin of heretohelp.bc.ca for creating What is Indigenous Cultural Safety and Why I Should Care About It. Their work and those cultural action tools are available for everyone. So please support Indigenous work like that as part of your reconciliation work and settler understandings. I'm just lucky enough to highlight and repeat them here. Uh, there's a wonderful person named Donna Bevins who created racialequitytools.org and has talked a lot about what, um, she has so many resource files on, on anti-racism issues. So if you identify as a, a group of people that might fall under the so-called other, it is really important that we understand what internalized racism, lateral violence is, so we don't perpetuate that violence that we've been taught through colonialism. And Donna Bevins has a piece about what is internalized racism. And it's really important that we all work on that, myself included, every single day, so that we um, support each other in the best way as we all move forward. Uh, the American Friends Service Committee has a great um, piece on do's and don'ts for bystander intervention for folks that might see somebody being targeted. So, for example, if you're on the sea train and you see a woman with a hijab being um, yelled at, do's and don'ts on how to intervene without necessarily calling the police right away. Um, 
you know, Indigenous people have been talking about issues, traumas, and reports, commissions, public hearings, just so it can be regularly disregarded. No more. Honor our words. Honor the treaties. Listen to politicians and their policies and platforms. Um, I think it's really important that I address the fact that yesterday the Sovereignty Act was passed here in Alberta. It's really important that folks understand that this was not in consultation with the treaties. Um, the treaty chiefs, Alberta was not created with any consultation with the treaty chiefs. And what Alberta, this little tiny infant having a ten temper tantrum, like a little toddler doesn't understand is that the only reason why Canada exists is because of those treaties. Even if Canada didn't properly honor them, even if Canadians don't understand that the government signed it on their behalf, these treaties are what allows non-Indigenous people to be here. So for our new premier to pass the Sovereignty Act just shows the absolute misunderstanding of relationship with treaties, relationship with Indigenous, and the relationship with Canada. This non-constitutional understanding, um, even in their own Western Westminster system, it's... Um, it's highlighting Alberta ignorance and it's um, embarrassing to folks like myself. So I, I just I needed to address it uh, slightly in this in this podcast. It could be its own podcast, but it's just really important when I'm talking about honoring the treaties, our premier, the folks who voted for them, the vote, uh, folks who voted in favor of the, the Sovereignty Act, they don't understand the treaties they are not honoring the treaties and uh, to the canadians listening the albertans who voted for these folks you are guilty by association and this has to be understood and in a time of reconciliation also if they don't understand marginalized in their budget with gender equity plus if they are cutting violence prevention programs services indigenous education uterus health choices gay straight alliances lack of human rights for migrants, immigrants, folks with disabilities, know that you're contributing to and negatively impacting so many people. Demand that they implement the TRC calls to action, the recommendations of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, the multiple reports on child welfare reform, uh, violence prevention. We have 231 calls to justice from the National Inquiry and on missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit. And we also have 113 uh, pathways to justice here in Alberta. So it's really important that you hold your MLAs to account on it. And honestly, the Sovereignty Act goes against all of those things I just listed. Um, municipally, we have the White Goose Flying Report. Denying all these reports is a form of abuse called gaslighting. Our people are experiencing extreme racism in the justice, uh, health, educational institutions with multiple reports that say the same thing, demand change from election platforms and politicians. If they don't understand colonialism, racism, privilege, and sexism, they literally have zero business running. This should be understood by all parties, local politicians, community organizations, sports clubs. Uh, Google our articles on how non-Indigenous Canadians can become allies because there's so many out there now. If you're experiencing emotional distress after anything we talked about today and want to talk, you can call the First Nation and Inuit Hope for Wellness Helpline at 1-855-242-3310. It's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you can also text on their hopeforwellness.ca website. If more related to missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and Two-Spirit, you can call 844-413-413. 6649. It is also a 24 seven crisis call line for folks. If you are non indigenous, uh, there are distress center lines in your area, usually a functioning 211, or you can call 833 456 4566. The 60 scoop indigenous society of Alberta is ssisa.ca. Uh, the following are two SLGBTQ plus crisis supports which are available in most areas across Canada uh, thanks to the Trevor Project. If you go to lifevoice.ca you can see the Trans Lifeline at 877-330-6366 and the Trevor Project for LGBTQ youth at 866-844-7386. Now 
the whole reason why I'm so grateful Elijah came on is that at the end of the day, a lot of these types of numbers don't acknowledge the two S and they don't have the intersectionality of understanding Indigenous or Two-Spirit. So that's why it's so important for us to all get counseling on a regular basis. But most importantly, there is a divide sometimes in the LGBTQ community because of the lack of understanding and the racism that is there. So always be uh, cognitive of that and work really hard at trying to respect that this is a real problem across this country. We want to be LGBTQ inclusive, yet we don't always include the two spirit. And I'm actually having a tiff with the local group over this right now. <laughs> Um, overdose and uh, drug crisis is a major issue right now, drug poisoning. Um, so our big, my big message is if you are using substances, do not use alone. If you are using, there are two apps that you can use, the Brave or Doors app. Uh, so you can download them and, and help you through that if you are using alone. The National Overdose Response Service also has a number at 888-688-NORS for support. Um, yeah, we're, we are losing hundreds of people a month over these drug poisonings. And uh, institutionalizing recovery is not going to work. It's going to create more trauma. Uh, doing the opposite of what we want. So I, I just do not support the direction our, our province is going in any capacity uh, with cutting services in that direction. Violence is my everyday reality. Every Indigenous generation has faced it. This is self-care, how I take my power back. This is why I started the podcast, to speak freely without interruption, tone police, leadership shaming, gaslight, gaslighting questions, as many people don't want to hear Indigenous opinion, but sure want to tell us theirs, even if they don't know anything about us. It is really important that folks listening understand what colonialism, colonialism is, the constant surveillance of Indigenous people, our protest, our vigil, and our rights. And um, the mainstream media does not give that space. That's why it's important to follow other Indigenous media, Indigenous people, and listen to our words. Um, I and many others share info on microaggressions daily. It's unacceptable to say them anymore. Learn about being trauma-informed. Folks like me are dealing with internalized racism and gatekeeping. <laughs> folks who survive off the status quo and are in their trauma. So that's why working on internalized um, oppression is really important. So we uh, don't stop people from doing good work and deplete all the personal resources. Internal and external racism is an everyday reality for me, Indigenous peoples, folks with disabilities, uh, LGBTQ2+, BIPOC, and others. Um, Masi Cho to my ancestors, to my granny, and my mama, what strength looks like through your example. I want to thank my dad for teaching me to be strong and blunt. My stepmom for showing me what a proud culture is uh, through her Austrian family roots and teaching me to be a proud Calgarian. It is through her. I am a second generation proud Calgarian. Thank you to my husband, Darcy, big Buffalo rock man, um, for producing and editing the show. On top of being my husband, my childhood friend, my editor, my producer, uh, he has been my support down the, my journey of the Red Road, witnessing decades of racism and sexism. And to our child, Thunderpipe Necklace Woman, we are blessed to learn from you every single day and we are honored you chose us. You give me daily accountability to be a better and stronger person. I hope my daughter and my family will be proud in the future of us trying to discuss these present day issues in a way that they can understand. My Patreon account is Native Calgarian, where you can pledge and support. Thank you to the previous donors for showing your support. If you value listening or watching and can afford to give, thank you. To those who cannot afford to give, I'd love to hear from you at nativeyyc at gmail.com, where you can send in your comments or questions. I also have a YouTube channel that you can go and subscribe, and you can go to nativecalgarian.com for the latest podca podcast and pin posts on social media. Um, I graduate tomorrow from the uh, Indigenous Accelerators program through TikTok. So I want to say thank you to TikTok for teaching me uh, not just about TikTok, uh, but a little more about who I am. I uh, had to do a lot of deep reflections on a lot of things, and I really appreciated 
that opportunity and the opportunity of all of the teachings of all of the guests you brought in and your staff. And uh, I was really honored to be selected. And for that, I just say Masi Cho from the bottom of my heart for empowering me to be a, not just a better podcaster, but also understanding a more of my responsibilities as well as I use my voice and I use my platform. And I want to end by giving side eye to those Calgary rabbits. You're lucky I'm not tradish. And my beautiful cousin responded, or you'd be in my dish. So thanks, folks, for listening.